How's everybody doing tonight? You guys feeling good tonight? Yeah? You guys excited to meet Jalen Brown? Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, it's so amazing to see you all here. Uh, my name is David Sun Kong. I'm the director of the Community Biotechnology Initiative here at the Media Lab. Uh, so I'm a synthetic biologist, which means that I work on developing technologies to make the living world easier to engineer. Um, I'm also a DJ and a uh, photographer and a mediocre rapper and beatboxer. But most importantly for today, uh, I'm a massive, massive Celtics fan. So um, I grew up in the Boston area, bleeding green, um, watching the 80s Celtics, so that maybe dates me a little bit. Um, I'm, actually, today's my birthday, so I just put that out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I personally can think of a, of a better present than to be able to um, uh, spend some time with, uh, with both Jalen Brown and also Cade Crockford, who's going to be uh, hopping up here in a second. So, um, you know, we kind of went through the, this, this very lean, you know, decade of 90s Boston Celtics into the big three era. And now I think we're kind of in like the big five era, probably, right? We got basically, you know, all-stars at every position and, and hopefully, uh, you know, some up-and-coming all-stars this year, too. So um, it's a real, real renaissance for Celtics basketball. So anyways, uh, this is an official ML talk, um, and so this is our talk series here at the Media Lab. Um, we're going to do the conversation, and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. And so um, I think at some point in the back here, yes, um, you can ask questions via Twitter, hashtag ML Talks, um, or visit Slido, and then uh, send your questions there, and they'll pop up on a screen, and we'll, we'll ask them that way. Um, also, for those of you that may not have technology, if you don't have a, a card or a, or a phone with you, um, Chia, who is over there, uh, so Chia has a series of no cards in the back, so if you have questions, you can also write them down there, and um, she will get them to us in the front. Um, and so those are kind of the basic logistical elements, and, um, and yeah, I, I really just couldn't be more excited uh, today to uh, bring Jalen Brown here to the Media Lab to come and have a conversation with us. And, uh, and I, before we do that, um, I'm super, super excited as well to introduce my co-host for this evening, uh, Cade Crockford. So, Cade is the Director of Technology for Liberty Program at the ACLU, and it's also a Director's Fellow at the Labs. So everybody, big warm round of applause for Cade Crawford. Thank you. Come sit here. Okay. Um, and so, so before we brought out Jalen, um, Cade, I thought it'd be great for you to introduce yourself to the audience and also to the internet. I forgot to mention this, this event's also being live streamed, so hello, internet. Um, Cade, yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, as David said, my name is Cade Crockford. I run something called the Technology for Liberty program at the ACLU here in Massachusetts. Uh, basically, we work to ensure that your digital rights are, are maintained, mostly First and Fourth Amendment rights, um, but also now we're looking into stuff like artificial intelligence and machine learning and the impacts that those technologies are having on civil rights and civil liberties. Shout out to Joy in the front row. We rely on a lot of her work. Um, so it's really wonderful to be here at the lab, uh, surrounded by so many practitioners of these tools, and I'm honored to be here, so thanks, David. Amazing. So everybody, um, I think without any further ado, um, we're going to welcome uh, Jalen. And so Jalen, I think as you all know, is, a, is an NBA player for the, our hometown Boston Celtics. Um, he played one season at Cal Berkeley, uh, where he earned first team all Pac-12 and Pac-12 Freshman of the Year honors. But beyond that, of course, Jalen has really, really deep interests off the court uh, with passions ranging from Spanish to history, finance, technology, meditation, philosophy, social justice, and beyond. And we're going to get into the, all of that and more right here on stage. So everybody, please join me in welcoming, welcoming from the Boston Celtics, Jalen Brown. Uh, so Jalen, welcome to MIT, welcome to the Media Lab. Um, I know we've had, uh, got, got to spend a little bit of time together and visiting the building and, and checking out the space. What are your first impressions of MIT so far? I feel, I feel smarter already. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so again, you know, the Media Lab, we, we, we had a nice chance to check in with Joey and talk a little bit as well, and you got to see, you know, Joy's projects and some of the other projects of the lab. Was there anything that kind of struck out, stuck, stood out to you so far from your, your visit? Yeah, right away, the, the first place I got to see was the, the Civic Media Lab, and basically, for people who don't know what it is, it's just basically connecting technology to, like, social justice issues, and it's a, it's a really, really dope space and stuff that I'm just now getting introduced with, and... And it's like the forefront of like what civil rights is going to look like in the future. So it's, it's really dope to get to see that. Yeah, and Cade, you know, again, this is one of your major areas of expertise is looking at that intersection between, you know, race, social justice, and AI. So, you know, I wonder, you know, with Joy's work and kind of Jalen's position as a, as a young emerging star in the NBA, um, how do we kind of pull that all together? What's, what's the opportunity there for Jalen? 
Well, uh, if you'd like to be a spokesman for the ACLU, that would be <laughs> fantastic. Um, well, we can talk about that later. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the work that, like I said, the work that Joy has done here at the lab has really helped us a lot at the ACLU because um, we're trying to figure out, you know, technology moves so quickly in, in this building, right? And in, in places like this all over Kendall and in Silicon Valley. And the law moves quite slowly, actually. It's, it does not move at the same speed of the development of, of technology. And so it's a real challenge for us to, to not only stay on top of the accelerating demands on civil rights that technology is producing, but also to be able to communicate the threats and the, and the opportunities, frankly, that those technologies pose to lawmakers and to courts, right? Um, so, you know, being here at the lab is a really important thing for the ACLU because, you know, the work, for example, that Joy did showing, um, and I think you saw this project, that face, face recognition yeah. systems that companies like Microsoft and other large uh, technology companies are developing are not race neutral, right? Like everything else in our society, um, they are actually not colorblind and tend, Joy's work showed, to be able to recognize white faces with almost 100% accuracy, white male faces, um, and are really, really bad at recognizing darker female faces, um, which has you know, a, a clear impact on civil rights and civil liberties, particularly when we see things like you know, the U.S. Customs Border Patrol using face recognition now at airports to you know, basically perform security checks. So um, you know, it's just like I said, it's actually imperative that we have that kind of research because uh, it really helps us make the arguments to lawmakers and to courts about why these technologies are dangerous and why we need you know, to pay a, ho a whole lot more attention to not just the impacts that they're gonna have, but actually the way that the technologies themselves work. So, and to kind of connect that, you know, Jalen, with, with a lot of your passions, right? One, one thing we talked about um, was this whole idea of anti-disciplinary research, which, you know, for those of you that are new to the Media Lab, uh, one of the big ethos is that we have is, the, is that, you know, when you look at different technologies, there's kind of silos, but, um, you know, chemistry, biology, or the arts, but, you know, really kind of the magic happens in the white spaces in between all of those disciplines. Um, and so I think you're, you're, you're feeling that term, anti-disciplinary research. And I just learned that term like 30 minutes ago. <laughs> so, like, I, 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 we say intersectionality, but it's just basically the combination of like learning different things and bringing them together. And I guess that's kind of why I'm here as being an athlete, a person of influence and talking about technology. I've been to Harvard and talked about education. A lot of times we dichotomize them as like separate like education, technology, sports, music, all of those different things are separate, you know, and a lot of times we forget to build those bridges and connections in between them. And I think the, it's very powerful to be able to do that. So, you know, and again, you know, I think one of the things that's been so exciting learning about you is all of the different passions that you have off the court, right? So I wonder if you could share a little bit more about, you know, kind of what are some of, the, what are some of those passions that you have uh, these days that you're really exploring? No, it's just hobbies, like just like anybody else. I don't think I'm any different from or any more spectacular than any of you guys that are here. It's just having different hobbies, and my goal is just to be um, very successful in my hobbies, so that's what I'm going for. <laughs> but what are some of your favorite ones right now? What are some of the ones you're focused on? Right now, I'm taking guitar lessons, I'm taking Arabic lessons, uh, I'm doing some streaming with Twitch. Like, like, uh, really? Yeah, so I just got into the video game thing. I've never been like a heavy video game player, but I went to Twitch. I went to Twitch's campus up in, in, in the Bay Area, and um, it's really taken over the world in terms of kids. You can be any skin color, shape, size, and you can, to be a video game player, you could be, it's, uh, it could be anything, you know what I mean? So for me to be able to, to tap into that and get on and start streaming and putting it online, I think that's gonna be pretty cool. Very cool, man. And so I'm wondering too, you know, again, going back to the, the anti-disciplinary concept, like, you know, do you feel like some of the interests that you have, you know, be it through language, philosophy, chess, and so on, like, do those, do those different forms of expression influence your play at all? So, I mean, you know, I know for me, for example, like as a DJ, I actually feel like being a DJ helps my science. It's something that I didn't put together early on, but like later on, like I felt like all of those different interests like really, really benefited me as a person. Do you, are you seeing any different ways that, that those, those forms of expression for you are, are, are influencing your career? Absolutely. I think they all have to do with not only my career, but just life in general in terms of situations like growing up, I used to play chess. And I think that's the best thing that I picked up at an early age, because when I started making decisions and have to make tough decisions like choosing a college, you know what I mean, and things like that, like chess, helped me see like the long, the end game, rather than so much worried about what's going on in the beginning. So 
all of that stuff kind of relates not only in my career, but my life as well. Amazing, amazing. Um, so I just want to bring a little bit in, um, you know, some of your, your interests around tech and innovation too. So, you know, one thing that, that um, and for those of you that all that may not know, you know, Jalen's, you've organized a couple of technology summits actually. And you've done a lot of work organizing a lot of the younger players, um, some of the newer players in the league. And so I'm wondering, you know, and again, you, 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 I think you, you interned at a VC uh, firm, and then you also, uh, you know, saw some Y Combinator pitches. Um, is there a particular way that you feel like technology is playing a role in your career, both on and off the court? Absolutely. I'm, I'm so fascinated. The reason why I'm here is like technology has like always been like the forefront of like industrializations in the United States. Anything in terms of like the betterment of society, making things more efficient for human activity. Technology has always been like the leader of that. So you, you come to MIT, what better place is to start here? And so just, this is a softball question. Um, you know, I know that you did go to Harvard. Um, so you prefer MIT to Harvard, right? <laughs> I'm plead the fifth. <laughs> right? <laughs> plead the I know, fifth. just from your expression, I think we all know what the answer is. So we, right, right. <laughs> but I, I felt that in my heart, Jalen. All right. Um, and so, so, yeah, you know, again, thinking about, you know, the long term of your career, you know, you've got all these different interests. And so do you feel like there's something kind of about how your career is unfolding that may be a little different than other professional athletes or other players in the NBA? What do you mean? Uh, I don't know, man. I mean, you know, we, I've heard you talk about this before, you know, this idea that, um, you know, kind of certain athletes, like uh, the multidimensionality of athletes right. is, is often... Um, you know, if like people are surprised that you have uh, all these intellectual passions and pursuits, for example. Um, do you feel like um, you, that you're looking at your career in a different way than some other athletes? Like are, are, certain, are certain athletes maybe too focused on the court and your interests are so varied? Is there, is there something unique I, about that? Or do you feel like there's a trend in the league towards multi-dimensionality? I think it's changing. Probably? I yeah. think it's definitely changing. Society puts a lot of pressure on athletes just to be athletes. Like they, anytime you make any type of political statement or anything that has to do outside of basketball, it's a, it's a pushback. Like you're, we, you're, we're paying you millions of dollars. We don't want to hear you talk about education. We don't want to see you at MIT. We just want to see you at Boston playing basketball. And it's changed so much in the last 20 years, in the last 10 years or so, in terms of like an athlete having influence and being able to talk and being a, having a voice. Really, you've seen uh, LeBron James and, and Kevin Durant talk about with the, the shut up and dribble thing that kind of really sparked it up and have people talking and things like that. But being able to not be put into a box is my whole thing. You know, being able just how everybody has hobbies, just how people have day jobs and then they go watch sports and go watch the Celtics play or whoever you're a fan of. Like, I, like sports is my day job and I like to do other things as well. So, man. And so, you know, again, you, know, you said earlier, right, you know, you've got your hobbies, but you also want to be great at your hobbies, right? You know, and I think that's one thing, um, uh, you know, for, for you know, as, a, as a huge fan of yours and a Celtics fan, you know, watching you train uh, and all the videos you're posting on, on social media and so forth, um, like, what inspires you to be great? I mean, you know, not everybody wants to be, you know, I learned how to play the guitar, but I'm not like, you know what I mean? I don't have like a, the necessarily the mentality to be great, but it feels like you have a, you know, kind of a DNA for, for greatness in, in these different domains. You know, where, where does that come from? You know? <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess my source, of my source of inspiration, I guess, would be sitting in the front row of my mom. Uh, mom, could you stand up for a second, please? Yeah, mom. <laughs> She, she doesn't like attention, so she's going to get me for that. <laughs> but, uh, that's my, my number one uh, source of inspiration and motivation from the, from the beginning in times. But as you travel, you have different experiences. You start to see and pull from different places. I read a book uh, called Still Like an Artist. I'm forgetting the author's name, but like, um, the, the concept of the book was basically um, when you, everybody's learned or got it from somewhere else. You know, the things people get ideas, they gravitate towards different things, and they just compile it and start some of the most creative companies that's ever been about. So that's kind of how I look at it. Like, I've been to Fashion Week in Paris. I've been to Bloomberg and at Technology Summits. I've been to a lot of different places, different countries, Indonesia. Um, and I've seen different things that just always catch my eye, and I just add it. Add it I, I write it down is the first thing, and then I just add it to my, my repertoire. So in addition to, to your mom, and again, it's been really great hanging out with your mom and your family. It's so great that you brought everybody here. Um, you know, again, mentorship seems to be like a really big part of your life. Um, 
you've only been in the year two, three years, but you've already been mentoring a lot of the younger players. Um, do you want to just comment a little bit about your, your, your role or what you feel mentorship, why it's important? And then the follow-up is, you know, who are some of your mentors? Who are some of the, the, the big people in your life, you know, other than mom? Well, I'll start with that question first. I think um, I've had a lot of mentors. You can learn, one thing my mom told me is you can learn something from anybody. So I've had a lot of people that I've pulled information from, but some of the people that have, have really stood out that people will recognize and know, like, uh, P. Diddy, Sean, Sean Combs. He, I've heard of him. He yeah. was, uh, <laughs> his thing was like for me when I met him, my friend, I met him right out of college. I was 19 um, and I came and sat down in his office and um, we just had a mutual friend or a mutual connection between friends and I told him I really wanted to meet him and sit down with him and he was, he was selling me on the water that they had just came out with. <laughs> like, that's the reason why he wanted me to be here. <laughs> but I wanted to talk to him about something totally different. He was trying to get me to um, sponsor or use my influence for Aqua Hydrate okay. or something like that. So he said, a lot of people have tried to be in this office. And he looked at me right now and said, why are you here? So that, that struck me in the sense, that was the first question that, again, it was impactful in the terms of like, it made me be like, you know, why am I here? Not even just like, here in his office, like, why am I here on his planet? Why am I on the Boston Celtics? Mm. What am I here to do? You know, and I just started thinking about what is my influence? What is my purpose? And how can I help and affect people? So why were you there? I was there to talk to him about, you know, I, I was just there to see Diddy, you know? <laughs> 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 and, we, and we started talking about uh, multiple means of influence, just how he was a uh, uh, producer, he was, uh, you know, he had his own clothing line, now he has his own uh, line of vodka, he's done so many different things and he's taken it serious in so many different avenues and it was the word that I always like to say was multiple means of influence. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe that, uh, you know, my final two questions in this, in this section, um, you know, again, going back to, to the leadership abilities, you know, you, you've uh, expressed, I think, some interest in the Players Association and uh, playing a more prominent role there. And again, you know, you're really doing a lot of leadership, it feels like, amongst the younger players. Do you have kind of aspirations beyond basketball for other types of leadership roles? I'm not necessarily asking you if you're going to be, you know, senator of Massachusetts in 20-whatever, but, um, but yeah, maybe, you know. <laughs> but yeah, do you, have, do you have those types of aspirations in, in leadership? You could say that. I think um, just in, um, it's, I guess, is it either you're a leader or you're a follower, right? And I, I choose to be a, a leader in a sense, but... To lead, you have to know how to, to, to follow, right? Is that, the, is that what they say? Yeah. That's, that sounds like, that sounds about right, right? <laughs> I think that's a saying. Yeah. That's a saying? Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I have some aspirations in the certain, like I want to be first, my first goal, I want to be, I want to be the player president of the union. Mm. Uh, hopefully I can be the youngest one appointed, but uh, we'll see how things turn out. Amazing. And then, um, you know, question here, this is, this is a big question, but um, how do you want to be remembered when your basketball career is over? Man, I just don't want to be forgotten. Mm. I think that's the, the biggest thing. I just want to make an impact in terms that, you know, maybe people will remember me not only for, you know, hopefully people will remember me not for what I did on the basketball floor, but a lot of people will remember me for what I do out, outside the basketball court as well. Just lead a bit, leave this place better than I found it, ultimately. So we want to talk about that, but before we do, I just want to follow up on the union question. What is it about um, the, the goal to be the president of the players union? Like, what do you want to do in that role? <laughs> uh, what do I want to do? Um, just basically be a, a bridge. I think being in that position, and, and I think Chris Paul has done a great job in terms of being in that position. And you've seen a lot of this stuff emerge and things that they've partnered with and things that they're doing now in terms of moving along with the future. You see what the union is doing now. They're doing like uh, investment. They're doing some, v they have some VCs that they hire. Now they're doing um, venture capital work in terms of like balancing out the leverage between players and owners. I won't say too much, but um, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that basketball players, they say, shouldn't know about. You cool. Know, it's a lot of business deals or a lot of things that, that disparity is different. And uh, we see it, we're taking aback a lot of that power in, in, in today's time. Worker power. Right, worker yeah, hell power, yeah. exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, so on the question of social justice, you know, you've written in The Guardian, you've spoken publicly about um, the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, about, um, you know, the reaction to Kaepernick's decision to kneel in the NFL. Can you talk a little bit about 
first, like what motivates you to, to speak about those issues that you know, potentially could both have positive and negative consequences for you personally? Um, what motivates me? I think, like everybody, our, our pain is what, what drives us. You know, seeing different things in your neighborhood, seeing different things around you, and then going to a university like Berkeley, a liberal university, and you start to be able to put a term to your pain. You like you got the now you have a name for what you've seen or what you experienced. So that was like my biggest motivation. Like when I first stepped foot at, at, at UC Berkeley, I took an education class and I started learning about all the different inequality and social injustice that you see, the um, the subtle like racism and stereotypes you see in the education system, there was a name for it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that there was, an, I'm thinking this is just coincidental. So when I figured it out that this is by design, like it started making me passionate. It started motivating me to, to start talking about this and here we are today. Yeah, it's not an accident, it turns out, right? And actually, you, before when we were talking, you said you had been doing some reading about MIT and the history of MIT. Is there anything you wanna share about that? Uh, anything I want to share? I know MIT was founded in, what, 1861 by William Rogers. I know that uh, it was post-Civil War, it was before the Civil War. Um, it was just basically just an industrialization of, like, the, the technology age in America just needed some type of change. And it's similar to where we're at now in terms of, like, we're still in that industrial age where we're still trying to see what's next and we're, we're forever in it. but. That's it, also, um, I did some reading about Robert Robertson Taylor. He was like the first African-American to graduate from here. Um, Ellen Richards was the first woman to graduate from here, so I did some research of my own, yeah. <laughs> Cool. So, um, one of the things that you've talked about previously that has really struck with me is this concept that in the United States, sports are used as a tool of social control. So can you talk a little bit more about that and maybe specifically unpack, do you mean um, it's used as a tool of social control in terms of controlling athletes or the public or both? Can be used, uh -huh. can be used. So it's, um, uh, sport, I love sports. You know, uh, people, when I said that, I got a, uh, some backlash and said, why are you, you're an NBA player, why are you, why, what do you have to say about sports? Why are you talking shit about sports? That's what they were saying. <laughs> but, uh, Sports as a, as a mechanism can be a mechanism of control of sports. It's basically saying that sports not only is a part of a society where it's like, it's an outlet for aggressive energy in terms of um, kids that they're experiencing, especially lower to middle class, they use sports as an avenue to, to release. Not only just people who play, people who watch. And a lot of people in here can relate. Like when you go to a, a basketball game, a Celtics game, after work, it's just like you can just let loose. You know, same thing um, with somebody how I felt when I was a basketball, when I was an athlete growing up, single parent household, you know, everything that was going on in my home situation, like sports was a way to just get away from that. And that plays an influential role in, in America in terms of keeping people distracted, but also keeping like a control over the masses. And maybe to, just to bring it a little bit local here too, um, you know, for the franchise you play for, the Boston Celtics. Um, by the way, I just feel like let's go Celtics chance, it's like appropriate. Not, not right now, but in general, you know, if you want to do it later. Um, but, um, but you know, the Celtics, right, have a, have a really interesting history with race relations. So the team itself, and you know, there's some facts that I've been learning as well, but um, the Celtics are the first NBA franchise to draft an African-American player, Chuck Cooper, in 1950. Um, the first NBA team to send an all-black starting lineup on the floor in 1964, and then Bill Russell was the first African-American coach in the NBA. Um, so all of that was happening at the same time that Bill Russell had a very, very tumultuous relationship and experienced a lot of racism in this town uh, in the 60s. And so I'm wondering if you have any reflections about, you know, kind of the history of the Celtics and kind of where we are today in 2018. Um, it's dope. It's dope to, to know the history of the Celtics and then be playing for them. Um, it's amazing when you start to hear stories from like um, people who are older than me, my elders, and they tell you about, you know, I used to rock with the Celtics just for that specific reason or just because of that specific reason. It almost makes it feel like it's fitting in, in a sense, like I, I was drafted to the right place and um, I'm happy to be here in Boston. <laughs> so to get back to um, social change and politics, 
we sort of briefly mentioned Kaepernick, right? <laughs> what do you think, if anything, has changed in U.S. sports, and this could be the NBA, the NFL, whatever, since Kaepernick, you know, made the decision last year to take a knee? I think the awareness is, like, through the roof. I think everybody's concerned. I think what, Ka what Kaepernick did, like, a lot of owners are, are nervous and scared that, that somebody on their team is going to do the same thing. So everybody's on, a, like, a, like on shaky grounds in terms because nobody wants to deal, like the media, the team, nobody wants to deal with no political issues and, and things like that just because it's just a lot to deal with. But what Kaepernick did and put his career on the line, is, 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 it takes a lot. Like it's a, more than most would do that. I mean, not a lot of people would do that. So um, in terms of being, at, being able to see him win an award yesterday at Harvard, the uh, W.E. Du Bois Award was, was special because not only was he it's un it was uncomfortable for him, which I got to see, because he's getting a reward for other people's pain. Mm. So he didn't feel like happy about it. You know, he felt like he just had to be there just because he had to be there. And just to see like interactions with him was, was really cool for me. He's also suffered though, right? I mean, quite a bit for the decision that he made and, you know, and for refusing to back down in the face of you know, threats from the NFL and even from the president of the United States, right? Who has turned um, Kaepernick's kneeling into like a campaign issue that he rails about. Yeah, I think he's content though. Like he lost over fifty million dollars because of him taking the knee. Like nobody, I don't think anybody in his room would probably would do that, and that's what makes him special. Like, would you give up fifty million dollars? I don't him? have fifty million dollars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. That's what that's what intrigued me about him because not a lot of people would do that and for him to put himself on the line like that for a cause that he thought that everybody thinks is important was is amazing simply amazing. And there's a, I'm assuming but you can tell us because you are a professional athlete there's a sense of solidarity among pro athletes across sports with with Kaepernick's stand. Yeah, like people people respect respect him for sure. They respect the they respect his, his, his protest, but they respect his sacrifice as well. Because you got, you got to think, pro athletes, we got families, we got, some of us have kids, wives, et cetera, or business aspirations and, and things outside of basketball that they, or football or whatever sport that they want to do. To sacrifice to that much amount of money is tough for anyone, you know? So um, we definitely respect Colin Kaepernick and Saluna for that. So one thing that, that's kind of interesting, though, to me is like, you know, in basketball, it feels like, um, you know, the past two years before the, the, the finals were even over, you know, both, both the Cavs and the Warriors were like, yeah, we're not going to go to the White House, right? And it feels like there was a real kind of united front, um, you know, LeBron, Seth, uh, KD, it was just, yeah, it, it, felt, it felt like Trump is kind of like, you know, poking the NFL and there's been all of this kind of division and, and things that have happened there. But the NBA, it just feels like there's been more of a united front. Um, I don't know if that's, if that's an accurate description, you think, or, or if, uh, if you, you as a player feel that way about the league. Um, I guess it's subjective. I think, um, I guess the team, the Warriors, the last few years have been able to win a championship. They have similar like-minded guys that feel the same, the same way. But the, um, I guess it, it's football is more players, so it's hard to come together as a group and decide something between 60 to 80 players. Uh, you got 11, 12, 13, 14 guys come together to make a decision, it's a little bit easier. So you talked about your mom being an inspiration for you. Um, was there anybody who inspired you to think critically about uh, politics, your role in the world, um, you know, racism, white supremacy, someone or, or even a book that you read that really inspired you to think differently about, about politics? That's a good question. I've actually never got that question before, so I have to sit here and think. <laughs> but uh, can we come back to that? Yes, I think yeah, we definitely, talk. definitely. Um, so the last question in this section around you know social and political challenges, basically, I guess it's a very vague question, so you should feel free to say, I'm not answering that. Are you crazy? Um, what do you see as like the main challenge faci facing the United States socially or politically right now? I mean, there are a lot of them, obviously, so. What do I see as the main challenge? Yeah. Socially and politically? That's another good question. Um, the main challenge, I just think uh, it's hard to really say. I can give my opinion. Yeah. But uh, 
my opinion probably is different from everybody's in here. So I think the main challenge is just, um, I think the wealth disparity is, a, is a definitely a challenge which starts to form into inequality because I think it's all about money. I think really what it is, I don't think um, racism exists, but like it's a group of people who are comfortable being uh, more successful than others. And I think that um, when the wealth disparity starts to change and then um, social inequality starts to decimate in 2018, things like social constructs are becoming not a thing. Like in terms of, I talk to my family about this a lot, things that used to be like in place and embedded are starting to, to dissipate in terms of like how you're supposed to look, how you're supposed to dress, um, what kind of hair color you got, your gender. These starting things are starting to not to matter in terms of you can have red or blue hair and dress any type of way and be the smartest guy in the room and people will respect you in that sense. 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, you walked into an interview with red or blue hair, like, what is he doing? You get out of here. You know, and you start to see things start to change over time. And I'm just hopefully I'll be a part of the generation where it, it starts to become a little bit more equal. So we can involve not only as just um, business people or educators or people in technology, but as human beings. You know, stop looking at people in these boxes and saying that because he's an athlete or because he's short or he's tall or he's white or he's black, that things should be a certain way. You know, I disagree with that and I challenge that statement. So uh, just to build on that, like, do you feel like there's a particular way that you see your role in that change? Possibly. Maybe that's why I'm here. Maybe me seeing my, my role in, as being an athlete and starting to untangle some of the, the um, stereotypes about athletes maybe that'll start a chain reaction and other things as well. But I don't, I've, that's my first time even really looking at it in that sense. I just mm. keep it in a bug, just being myself and, and going from there. <laughs> one, one of the best uh, um, quotes that I saw from you from an interview was uh, you said that um, you're, either, you're either the fly in the room, or you're, you're either the fly on the wall or the elephant in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Is that right? I'm the fly on the wall or the elephant in the room. You choose. <laughs> So hopefully, you know, you know, here too at the lab, we can support you and, and while you're the fly on the wall until you're ready to, to be the elf in the room. Um, so amazing. I think, uh, is there anything else you want to ask, Kate, this part? Um, I don't think so. I mean, if you, if you can think of a book or someone who's inspired you. Oh, yeah, you hold that one. Hold that okay. one. But, but no pressure if, if it's something that, you know. I would say um, when I first got to Cal, I took an Education 38 class. And uh, our first reading we got was uh, Pedagogy of the Press, and it was by Paulo. Hell yeah. <laughs> That's a it was uh, Paulo Freire, or mm -hmm. Freire, and he's a Brazilian educator, and he devoted his, he devoted his life's work to, to education, and, and that was one of the things that kind of really stood out to me. And it's a really, amongst educators, it's like one of the significant pieces, I would think, and um, that would be one of the pieces that stood out to me. Awesome. Awesome. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of what's happened to you in the off season too. So you know you mentioned in, in uh, earlier that one of the places that you went to was Indonesia. Um, I got some some family here from from Indonesia as well. And uh, and yeah, so I'm curious. You know, it, it feels like each each kind of experience that you have like opens your mind and, and really kind of gives another another part of your part of the puzzle for Jalen. So do you have any any particular reflections about your trip to Indonesia? Um, Akushi Takamu, Indonesia. <laughs> 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 which means like I, I love you to, to Indonesia. Um, Indonesia was great like uh, for me to be able to travel uh, for me to be able to travel you know 20 hours away from where I'm comfortable at and be somewhere where I'm not it just makes you see life in a different way like for me um, going out there they told me it was a third world country like I went to Bali first and I went to Jakarta next and Jakarta is probably one of the most beautiful cities that I've ever seen in my life, if not the most, in terms of like the technology, in terms of like how in up to date it is, the city is just like amazing. Like I thought I was in the future. Like it looked like I was 20 years beyond the time that we were in. <laughs> like they got, they had like projectors in the sky. Everybody's watching like anime, the whole city. I was like, <laughs> I was like man, this is amazing. This was incredibly dope. And uh, I really appreciated my time there. Do you have any uh, other places that are on your list that you really want to go visit? Tokyo, Japan mm. is, is one uh, terms. It's another city that's really big in technology. And um, I've seen Tokyo Drift, and I was like, I got to go there. <laughs> so, so, not, you know, so, so you had a chance to meet Joey a little earlier today. Joey's the guy to show you Tokyo. 
Okay. So Joe, I don't know if you know, he started a night, he dropped out of college to start mm -hmm. a nightclub in Tokyo back, back, back in the day. So, oh, so, man, so yeah, he's, he's the guy, he's the guy. <laughs> definitely stop. Um, stop awesome. <laughs> so maybe we can shift gears a little bit and actually talk a little bit about hoops. So I know, I know, you know, I'm, I'm again, just massive Celtics fan. So, so it's, a, <laughs> it's a, a, a big season that we got coming on. And, you know, I'm wondering, um, you know, both, both Isaiah Thomas, who's one of your mentors and Tommy Heinsohn have said that, uh, you know, they predict that you're going to be the NBA's most improved player this year. And um, I mean, obviously you've been working hard in the off season. Are there particular elements of your game that you've been working on that you feel like uh, we will, we'll be able to see this year? Um, I hope so, uh, yes. But I've gotten so much better from my rookie year to my second year, and now from this year to now. I mean, from last year to now, I've gotten so much better. So um, I can't wait to be able to get on the floor with everybody and have the full game plan and get things rolling because we got a really special team here in Boston, and, and I'm super excited, and, and we, we really want to bring that banner home for, for everybody here in Boston. I feel like now's, now's the let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I, there are like several text threads that I have with my friends where we, all we do is, it's like totally, it's year round. I like look at my phone, I got like 90 messages from these guys. We're always just talking about the Celtics. Um, you know, and again, Kyrie has said that he's gonna resign now. Um, just any reflections about the specific team that you got going? You, you said it's special, but can you, can you just say a little bit more about, about this team? The, the talent level, it's a challenge every day. Like even today was a challenge. Like every day it's like a challenge because you got somebody in your position or somebody that plays your position that can also play other positions that's right there, right next to you, challenging you for minutes, challenging you for, you know, shot, everything. You know what I mean? On the defense end, they're challenging you. On the offense end, they're challenging you. So it's, it's beautiful because, you know, I love to compete. Like, that really grinds my gears competing and, and being at the highest level. So getting to go against Kyrie, Terry Rozier, Jason Tatum, Gordon Hayward, just being able to be in that room and be able to compete with the, the best is, is amazing. And we so, challenge each other every day. So in practice, who drives you the craziest? Who drives me the craziest? Yeah. Marcus Smart. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. Easy. It's just like he's fouling. Like today he, he hit me with an elbow and I'm like, he was on offense. <laughs> <laughs> I was on defense. <laughs> he hit me with an elbow. I was like, man, you know what? I'm going to just go out. I'm going to suck. Yeah. yeah, can we talk about the fact that Marcus Smart got ejected from a preseason game? <laughs> <laughs> wild, wild, yeah. Uh, all right, all right. So, so before we uh, turn it over to the audience, because I know, I know everybody's excited to get in as well, um, I got a bunch of just get to know you questions, okay? And this is some technology here. I've never used this before. We're going to do this together. But so, all right, so this is some rapid fire technology, qu or, uh, get to know you questions. Let's hear them. Oh, actually, over here, over here with me first. Oh, yeah. Boy. All right, so, <laughs> so, so first question, you kind of answered this about the social part, but just general favorite book. Do you have a favorite book? A favorite book? Man, I, I love books, but I, it's hard to, to choose like a favorite. How about one you're reading right now? What I'm reading right now, I'm actually reading um, a book called Brain Types. Brain Types? Yeah, by uh, a doctor that gave it to me that uh, works for the Celtics. It's like categorizing different brain types. I'm not going to, some <laughs> weird stuff, but it, it's pretty entertaining. Like, it's dope. It's like certain brain types that exist and understanding people's brain types will help you understand them and how they act and how to interact with them. And it's, Bunch of weird stuff. It's All right. To help you with Marcus throwing balls. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right uh, favorite movie? Favorite movie? I'm going to go Love and Basketball. Mm, all right. Great. All right. Uh, favorite album? Favorite album? I'm going to go Kendrick Lamar, Good Kid, Mad City. Mm, oh. this, is, this is so great. Song of the moment? Song of the moment? Uh, I'm going to go. Childish Gambino, Summertime. Mm, all right. Um, is there particular music that you'd like to play to get yourself hyped before a game? Uh, anything, Lil Baby or in, in Gunna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get some snaps for that. <laughs> uh, favorite food? Favorite food? Uh, that's tough. I love food, so it's hard, it's hard to choose a favorite food. But and your mom's sitting right there. I know, there. I was just going to say. Yeah. Oh, she just gave you the side eye. Uh, she, she's good for that. She's good for that. Uh, favorite food, uh, it's too hard to choose. Yeah. All right, we can hold that one. Um, any favorite fashion or style icons? You've been, doing, you've been doing a lot of fashion work recently, so. Yeah, like um, a lot of stuff I pull from my fashion is like Japanese influence. Mm. Like I grew up watching anime in terms of like Sailor Moon, in terms of Avatar. 
um, anything like anything anime like I was watching. I love Dragon Ball Z, um, anything, Boondocks, like all different <laughs> types of like I grew up watching. So um, a lot of my style and stuff I pull from like anime and things like that. So um, some of my fashion influences are like Yogi from Y3. I think he's dope. Uh, I, met, I got to meet the designer for um, Sakai as well. And she's a Japanese based um, influencer and creator and designer. But um, I love fashion as well too. Beautiful. Um, so athletes are notoriously superstitious. Do you have any superstitions that you can share with us? I'm not superstitious. No, I'm not at all, really. Huh. Are you? What's yours? Man, well, before, when I, before I play NBA games, I have a, I have a whole set of things, non-things that I do, because I right. never play NBA games. Um, okay, there are a lot of fan superstitions, though. You don't it's have true. any? That's true. Oh, my God, of course. You all have right. to, like, get up and, you know, if you're sitting in a certain spot for too long and the Celtics aren't doing well, so then it's like, you. all right, you know, i got to play my role to help the team yeah, exactly. and stand up. And, exactly. You know. <laughs> I've got a lot of friends. I mean, we, we have very sophisticated <laughs> systems that, that are a big part of your yeah, game, actually. You <laughs> yeah, just so you know. Just so you know. We're going to develop some suits here tonight, actually, just to, just to help you out. Okay, the cool. So, so David's it. really pulling for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so other random question, who, who do you think is the funniest guy on the team, on the Celtics? Funniest guy on the yeah, team? Yeah, funniest guy. We got a lot of guys who think they're funny. <laughs> <laughs> so you. <laughs> no, You're I'm not the, the funniest, funniest guy, guy on the team. I'm pretty, I like to just, I'm, I'm just watching. You know what I mean? That's my role. But that was it, a good joke, though. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Terry, Terry thinks he's funny. <laughs> Marcus thinks he's funny. He's hilarious. But it's something like Marcus always, he don't say nothing to nobody else. But when I walk in, here comes JB, look at this. <laughs> like, Marcus always got something to say to me. Kyrie, same way. Kyrie won't say nothing to nobody else, but as soon as I walk in, it's just like I'm an easy target. <laughs> so actually, this year, I got some jokes written down <laughs> and pre prepared for each one of them so I can just, so they know I'm not sweet, you know what I mean? I got, I got some jokes lined up for them. Uh, amazing. All right. Well, I guess the final one for me is um, uh, just, you know, I found out uh, actually from our mutual friend from Boaz that, that Cade, actually hoops and was was the star were you, were you the mvp of your high school basketball team oh god no why are you spreading these lies so, no i actually no. I read that on the internet no. and everything on the internet is real so so i heard that Cade was was the star of her of her, her, her team i'm five two so just so you know so if i was the star of my basket of my driveway basketball league, i believe that i was unbelievable there you can see that so what i think is i feel like the three of us in like a three-on-three -three tournament i think we could kind of take anybody we should just join the big three we should just hit up ice cube <laughs> yeah Y'all heard it here, okay? Just, so. what, is, what does everybody think? This would be a pretty good team, right? A <laughs> few um, claps, two claps. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> I believe it, though. I believe it. Um, all right, well, why don't we shift and, uh, and take some, take some uh, questions from the audience. So I think, I think um, how this is going to work. Oh, we're going to adjust your mic a little. Um, but Cade, we can look at this too. So I think um, everybody's been giving some questions and then they're Yeah, people voting. really like the veganism question. Yeah, let's go with that one. You want, you want to? Are you a vegan? I'm not a vegan. I, uh, I do enjoy vegan cuisine. Does that count? Yeah, I think so. Right, cool. And the question specifically is, do you think more athletes should embrace veganism or part-time veganism more? I, I hate putting the, the title on yeah. stuff. That's my thing. It's like the title of it. Like say I go a whole year being a vegan, and then it's like one day that I choose to, to, to eat a bowl of ice cream, you're no longer a vegan, yeah. you know what I mean? And people, it's a very people, rigid. Yeah, so it's like, you're yeah. no longer a vegan because that one time that right. you have, what's the name? So I don't like putting time, I just enjoy eating healthy, and if anybody likes to eat healthy, they should eat what works for them in their body. Amen, yeah, harm reduction, right? Truth. Um, there was another question that got voted down, but I thought it was interesting. Did you fast this summer? Was that? Um, I actually did, yes. And did that, did that have any impact on your game or your training or what? I actually did it during the playoffs, okay. actually. And, what was uh, that like? I felt like it took me to another level. I think I, I, uh, I had a pretty good playoffs this year, but um, I didn't tell anybody or anything because I felt like, you know, of course, people would be like, what are you thinking? Like, you're guarding LeBron James and you're not eating? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're done. <laughs> but... It, it, it actually turned out to be pretty good for me, and it worked. All right, so um, this is an interesting one. What, what is, oh, they're, they're moving so fast. Um, one was about the community. So what are your favorite ways to get involved in the community in Boston? Um, 
anything. Like, uh, I'm actually developing a routine now. I have my community guy right here, John Borders. Um, John, can you stand up for us for a sec? Yeah, John. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm actually developing a routine here in Boston and just have it a little bit more effective, like I'm a little bit more tailored to myself in terms of going into the community and really like affecting things, I have some events planned and, and, and using some of my money in my own pocket to kind of help out in these situations. I'm here, so yeah. I'm a part of the community as well. So uh, anytime you can, you can reach out and uplift the youth or um, the kids or any type of way, those are, they're going to be the future. Yeah. You know, the, the kids that are in the crowd that are sitting here watching, those are going to be the ones that are going to carry the torch. So anytime I can spill into somebody that's young, I'm just like making an investment. Hopefully that they'll just do their part to continue on making society, Boston, everywhere, a better place than what it was. It's amazing, man. I think just, you know, for me too, and I'm sure for Cade in the lab, I mean, I think we're all really excited about that. You know, you know, hopefully you're here for the rest of your career, right? And you can really put down some roots here and do a lot of good work with us in the community. So, so really, really excited. Thank you. Um, is there a way for the questions to not move so fast? I feel like we, we, we just gonna ask. Well, we just lost one about the Toronto Raptors, which, I, are you scared of them? I think that's the question. <laughs> Right? <laughs> I won't even answer that one. <laughs> there are a lot of questions coming in. It's like, they're changing like every three no. seconds. Like, it's pretty cool. Well, okay. Here's one. Um, do you feel there needs to be a dichotomy between being a famous athlete, entertainment figure, and being a politically conscientious or active individual? No, I don't think it needs to be a dichotomy. I think it's all like, like what we just talked about. What was the word? Anti anti-disciplinary yeah. yeah it's like just a, the intersectionality between the two like not only do i represent the celtics i represent uc berkeley i represent my my family my parents i represent myself so like when i go out there it's not like i'm just a boston celtic you know i'm a member of uc berkeley yeah. i just spoke at harvard i represent them so it's like you got to think in an account like there's a there's a there's a lot more there's a bridge between a lot of this stuff that we're missing i think there's a bridge between basketball and influence in technology. There's a, there's a, there's a, a, a bridge between technology and education, yeah. of course, that everybody knows. There's a lot of bridges yeah. that are there, and I think um, bringing them all full circle instead of looking at them as separate yeah. entities is the key. Beautiful, man. Can I just jump in? You, yeah. you didn't say I represent Atlanta. What is it like to be an, a professional athlete like representing a city that you're actually not from like what is that like it's interesting you know um that's the part like it's nothing you can i can't control you know right. that like boston celtics drafting I'm, I'm happy that they drafted me the history here title town etc and i represent boston as well now since that point but just being from atlanta and, and being from that area and seeing the things that i've seen going to school there and, and some of that pain that i've learned um, have the title for now that I mentioned earlier is a part of my, my motivation. So doing stuff a lot for my city and going back to my city and giving back and talking to kids that are from the same situation I'm from or going through the same system that I went through is inspiration, you know? And um, everybody has that, that feeling when they go home. Like there's nothing like home, you know what I mean? So a lot of my source of, um, a lot of, my source of inspiration I'm drawing and I'm pulling from the, the people that I grew up with, the teachers that I ran into, the community, because I know that it's a lot of little kids that might be watching this right now that are from my same neighborhood, from my yeah. same situation, and thinking like, look, like I can do that, and they can. It's beautiful, man. Um, the most popular upvoted question, <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but we'll have to ask it, I will ask it. So it's in giant capital letters. <laughs> what do you think about the Jimmy Butler situation, is, is the question. <laughs> So Jimmy's my guy. I think a lot of people know that. <laughs> I've been working out with Jimmy for like the last three years, and Jimmy's a stone cold killer, man. Like, <laughs> he is militant. He has a routine. Like that's I'm learning that now, having a routine because there's a lot of power in routine. But he has everything. Like he doesn't leave his life to chance at all. Like I've never seen it. Like in terms of when he eats, when he sleeps, when he has company, when he has Bible study, when he has practice, recovery, all of this is on like a sheet. And he has somebody be like, no, we can't do that. We got this for 30 minutes. Then we got this for 30 minutes. His whole life is on a sheet of paper. Wow. And it's like, so he, he really puts the dedication in 
like to, it takes it to another level. So in terms of like heart, like if, if anybody I'm riding with, I'm riding with Jimmy. So do you feel like you're, you're, start, you're, you're saying you're inspired by that? Are you bringing some of those elements into your game too? Absolutely. You know, in terms of work ethic, in terms of that, that, that passion for the game, that sacrifice, like to be in that point, you got to sacrifice a lot. Like Jimmy lives a very simple life. Like this summer, he was like in the middle of like Calabasas, like away from every, everything and everybody. It took me almost like an hour to get there or two hours almost from the airport. And it's just like, he's in the middle of nowhere and he doesn't go out, he doesn't go to the city. Like he sacrificed so much, he doesn't drink or do anything. He sacrifices so much for his body, his career and his mind to be able to do, to be in a position that he's in now because his position wasn't the easiest of positions where he came from. You know, at one point he was homeless. Now he's making a hundred million dollars in the NBA. Just think about that. Yeah, crazy. Um, I like the question about Arabic. Yeah, let's do you this You said part. you're studying Arabic. Why, why did you pick Arabic of all languages? Um, I, I, have a, I have a few languages that I want to learn. Like I, when I went to Indonesia, I did a little study on Bahasa, and I learned a, a, a little bit about that. But I, I want to be able to be not necessarily fluent, but being able to, to converse. And also it just makes you a little bit more worldly. It makes you, when you go to different places, I think it goes a long way when people, when you try to connect with people in their language, you know what I mean? Uh, and things like that. So that's what I'm, I'm trying, I'm going for. I've been to Dubai a few times and I have a lot of friends who, who speak Arabic. So that's kind of where it started. Cool, it's a um, beautiful language also. It is, very, very. I like this one at the bottom here. What advice do you have for MIT students? What got advice? Of, we got a lot of MIT students in the building here, so. Um, what advice do I have for MIT students? Uh, I would just say, just um, keep an open mind and connect, and connect with as many people as you can. There's a lot of people that can benefit from the information that you guys are learning here at MIT. You know, sometimes I know like a lot of the um, academias are private and they keep their information in house, but spread the word, man. Yeah. <laughs> like people like me would, like are, are thrilled to be here. Like I'm happy to hear about the Civic Media Lab. I'm happy to hear about biomechanics and, and things like that. This, this is dope to me. <laughs> like it's super dope just to be here because um, just humble beginnings at first, but then these are the type of things that are gonna be sparking change. These are the type of things that's gonna be affecting our future. So anytime you can you can spread that information to the masses, I think that's what's gonna be that's yeah. what civic media yeah. is, really, right? That's a huge lesson and I think if there are MIT people, I think that's incredibly wise. It's really easy in a place like MIT to just get focused on the little gadget you're making. And I think especially now more than ever, um, being able to communicate that, understand the social context of the technology we're working on is all hyper important. So, and yeah, you know, my hope is too over the years that, that uh, we can collaborate and, and really bring that layer of social context onto uh, the technology that happens at a place like I, MIT. I think that's the purpose of the Media Lab, right? It's just to create a space where you can make that happen. Just. Yeah. Uh, bring that, that influence and put it in a space where you can connect with different people and broaden a lot of the stuff that you guys are doing here because just being able to see it, just even if I was only here for a quick amount of time, like I can tell like this stuff is gonna be, this is, this, <laughs> this is some high level information right here. Beautiful, man. I got a quick, yeah. two quick questions for you. What is your favorite thing to do in the weight room and what is your least favorite thing to do in the weight room? <laughs> I'll start with my least. My favorite, my least favorite is to be in the weight room with Aaron Baines. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's loud, he's lifting 400 pounds, like he's yelling like a Viking. <laughs> I'm like, this is, this is overwhelming. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't wanna be there when Aaron Baines is there. <laughs> But that's his And what's your favorite thing? My favorite thing, just probably working on my body. I think you're, you're just how people, um, your body just has to be able to keep up with your mind. But like favorite lift, like you a squat Favorite suit lift, like um, what's a favorite lift? I don't know, maybe like the ab, X, get your core right, you know. Kate, are you, do you have like a, a, a fitness thing going on right now? Yeah, like. Get some... <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, this is not about me, David. This is about Jalen. <laughs> there was a question that was there that disappeared that um, I thought was interesting. Why do you think that Kaepernick style protests have not spread to the NBA? Mm. I mean, there was like a couple years ago during the Eric Garner protests, uh, LeBron had his team come out in those I can't breathe t-shirts, right? Um, but like, you know, what, what's, what was going on last season? Why do you, that's a good, I mean, that's a hard question to answer. And I don't think that, 
like um, my opinion would justify that answer. Why don't I think that spread to the NBA? In ways it has, it's drawn awareness, and I think that a lot of people have their foot in the door, but why haven't people particularly taken the knee? I think um, there's other ways to, to draw attention to something, and, and there's ways, and there's, uh, then there's other, other ways that you can do it. And I think the way that Kaepernick did it was like a way that people are gonna take notice in this right away. Yeah. I think it's been misconstrued about his intent yeah. behind it because people took it as disrespect to the flag. So yeah. I think that people now, they, like when they do it now, if an NBA player were to do it, I think people wouldn't want to associate with the negative intent side of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, um, but his intentions were, were pure in his, in his mechanism and it just was misconstrued and the media kind of ran with it. And now he's painted as a picture of a bad guy, but it was to worry social awareness with police brutality, inequality in our neighborhoods etc. And, um, and it, it worked. It really did. And I think that it's a continuing process. I don't think it's a, a ever ending process, but um, I think everybody can be a part of that. It doesn't have to be an athlete. It doesn't have to be a, a politician. It could be social media. Like a lot of people, everybody has a voice now. And how, how positively are we using that voice? You know, people talk a lot of mess <laughs> on social media and they enjoy do it, trolls and, and saying all type of things like your voice, what you put into this world, you're into the universe is, is powerful. So I think we all play a hand in it. Media, um, fans, politicians, athletes, we all can make a, a, a conscious effort to, to watch what we say or try to put positive, no, not even to watch what you say, just try to put positive energy back into the world. We see a lot of people say a lot of negative, harmful things about people they never met or don't even know. Like, what is the benefit of that? Like, what is the purpose of that? Does that make you feel better for, to, for today? Yeah, that's gotta be really hard. I mean, I see some comments that people who are like sitting on their couch at home are making about professional <laughs> athletes on, on the internet, like writing back to athletes and saying like, oh, you suck or whatever, and it's like, you're literally on your couch right now. Like you clearly. I'm have fine. No I'm fine with that. I don't have a really? problem with that. You, so the haters don't. It doesn't yeah, they don't. Like you. people tell me I suck all the time. Like that's cool. That's an opinion. That's a different thing. But when you start, it's like it's, it's it's a line you can cross. Like everybody has an opinion. You can have an opinion about anything. But when you cross that line and start going into other things and and stuff like that, like people tell you to be quiet or shut up. You're just a stupid basketball player. I feel like. That's a little excessive, you know? So it's okay if people critique your game, but yeah. not if they critique you as a person? That's life. I mean, I can't stop anybody from doing anything. I'm just little old me, you know what I mean? <laughs> but um, it would be nice to see everybody kind of make a, a social effort to kind of, you know, be better humans, right? I think that's the goal. Yeah, yeah. That's beautiful, man. Um, I guess uh, one final question for me I was just thinking about too. Um, you know, obviously in the NBA, uh, you know, there's really quite a lineage of outspoken players. You know, you had, uh, you know, Craig Hodges. I was reading about this recently, actually. You know, my, 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 my friend Manav hit me to this article, which I thought was really amazing, talking about, um, you know, after the 95-96 season, um, or sorry, in, in 91, actually, Craig Hodges, he approached uh, Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson um, during the NBA Finals and actually said, like, hey, we should just have, we should boycott the Finals right now to make a statement about uh, race. Right, uh, which I thought, which kind of blew my mind that that, that was a thing, and that you know mm -hmm. Michael said that apparently Michael Jordan apparently said he was too crazy, and Matt, Matthew Johnson said it was too extreme, um, and then you had you know um, uh, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, formerly Chris Jackson, who also you know had some Ooh. had some really um, and I apologize if I mispronounce the name, um, had some significant um, kind of role at that time too, and I'm wondering you know just within the NBA, you know, have, do you have any reflections about some of those players and kind of the the activism that they had? Um. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. I, I don't, I don't want to say I'm following any particular mode because I'm not. I was just being myself. It initially, it just started from my, my passion, from like education yeah. and my passion for, you know, inequality and things like that. And, and sports has a lot of a big influence in that. But uh, just seeing some of those guys and hearing some of their stories is dope. But uh, I kind of do things my own way yeah. in a sense, you know. Uh, I, I don't necessarily have a t particular mode that I'm following or I'm trying to be the next this or the next that like I see something that is important to me and if it comes in if it strikes me and I feel like I need to talk about it like I'm just not afraid to talk about it and I don't think I'm trying to be the next anything um, or 
I don't want people to hold you when you start speaking on certain things. They say you're the this or they put you in a box and that's fine, that's cool. But at the same time, it's just like, I'm just not afraid of speaking about the stuff I'm passionate about. I'm not trying to be anything, you know, I'm just being myself. It's beautiful, man. Well, I think that's a perfect note for, for us to end on. Um, so uh, everybody, could we just give one big round of applause here? Thank you.